welcome. Welcome on a drizzly Sunday morning that apparently is going to get nice and sunny. As any day, it is a great day to worship the Lord. Um, I wanted to start with um, a, a quick passage from Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, starting verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not heard? Have you not, have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall fail, faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This morning, if you feel wearied by the, wor by the world, by what's going on, it's time to fix your eyes and your heart on the Lord. And as you wait upon the Lord, he will renew your strength. Amen. Let's rise and lift our voices to the Lord. Turn your ear to heaven and hear the noise inside. It's the sound of angels are in the sound of angels songs and all this for a king we could join and sing for all to christ the king how constant how divine the song of ours will rise oh how constant how divine the song of ours will rise, will rise. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. He is holy. He is holy. Oh, praise Christ the King, oh, infinite and sweet, this love so rescuing, oh, how infinite and sweet, this great love that has redeemed as one.
a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. God reads down the waters part before us now. Come and see what He has done for us. Tell the world of His great love. Our God is a God who saves. Our God. Let God arise, let God arise, our God reigns now and forever, He reigns now and forever, let God arise, let God arise, our God reigns now and forever, He reigns now and his enemies will run for sure the church will stand she will endure Behold the keys of life, our Lord, that has no sting, no final word. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Our God, our God is a God who saves. God who saves. Let God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Let God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever he reigns now and forever let God arise let God arise our God reigns now and forever he reigns now and forever let God arise let God arise our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Were creation suddenly articulate, with a thousand tongues lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we hear christ be magnified were the whole earth echoing his 
time it ends. His name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We hear Christ be magnified. be magnified let his praise arise let Christ be magnified in me oh Christ be magnified from the altar of my life Christ be magnified in me when every creature finds its inmost melody Every human heart's native cry, then in one in rapture him of praise, we sing Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me, oh, Christ be magnified in the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. I won't bow down to idols, I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice cause you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings, I'll hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Death has been defeated, we have resurrection life. And if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing, my song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified, let it praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified. From the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Your presence is all I need. It's all I want, it's all I seek, and without it, without it there's no meaning. Your presence is the air I breathe, the song I sing, and the love I need, and without it, Without it, I'm not living. I will exalt you, Lord. I will exalt you, Lord. There is no one like you, God. I will exalt you, Lord. I will exalt you, Lord. No other name be lifted high. Your 
presence is all I need. It's all I want and it's all I seek. And without it, without it, there's no meaning. Your presence is the air I breathe. The song I sing and the love I need and without it, without it I'm not living. I will exalt you, Lord. I will exalt you, Lord. There is no one like
nearness of the Lord right now. I feel His presence here. Uh, but as you're standing here, uh, just just keep your mind on Him as I read this passage from Isaiah. Imagine Him um, the way He's described to you. In the, this is Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Imagine that, just imagine looking up into the sky and seeing a throne suspended in the air, and there's there's the king, and his, his glorious robes are so great, so rich, that they stretch all the way from the top of heaven down to earth, filling the temple. Above it stood seraphim, seraphim. each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. One cries to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Another one cries, the whole Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. They continue to cry back and forth one to another. I, as a prophetic act, I want to I want to act this out. I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. I want somebody to cry out back to me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. As they were crying that to one another, the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. As we're dwelling on the holiness of God, I hope you're shaken. As, you, as your mind is on just how pure and beautiful and good and righteous he is, have the same reaction that Isaiah did. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah is undone as, as the holiness of God is revealed, and the seraphims are shouting how holy he is. He says, I, can't, I cannot be here. I don't belong in, in, in the presence of the Lord. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my lips with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy. And shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities are laid waste without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate, the Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet, a tenth will be in it, and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains where it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. How long? How long? How long is it going to be, Lord? The Lord says, it's going to be pretty rough. But there will be something that remains. I will ensure that there will be growth and fruit.
fruitfulness in its time. And you are the person, you are the people I'm going to use in that time. Although it seems like it's not happening, it seems like they're not hearing, keep on being faithful. Keep on speaking my word. And believe today, this is the message for us. Be faithful, be persistent, continue. Continue to dwell in his presence, in his holiness. Continue to come before him and be broken and say, I don't belong here. And allow him to cleanse you and make you right and make you a tool for his work. Amen. Let's bless the Lord one more time. Thank you, Lord. Ethan, thanks so much for leading us worship. Let's thank Ethan. We've got a few announcements here um, before we get into the word. Uh, Chris, if you would be ready to take the offering, we'll take, we'll take the tithes and offering in just a second. Um, so, a few announcements uh, before we move on, um, before we release the children to their program. Um, next Sunday, so uh, Sunday that would be the 5th. Yes. Next Sunday the 5th at 6 p.m. there's going to be a special service at CFC Potsdam. They're celebrating their 10th anniversary. Um, it's also going to be a time for prayer and, and uh, ministry of the Spirit. I want to encourage anybody who can make it out. Um, we're going to be there, uh, right? That's on our calendar. Yeah, we're going to be there. Um, and uh, we encourage you, anybody who can make it out, it's going to be a, a good time um, in the Lord. And then in a few weeks, September 18th at 2 p.m., there's going to be a, a special gathering amongst the, the churches. So it's going to be us, uh, the Magic Church, the Canton Church, the Potsdam Church, the Richville Governor Church. Um, we're all going to gather there. By the way, that's where Pastor Rick and Darlene are this morning. Um, they're, in, uh, they're in Richville with the saints there. Um, but on the 18th at 2 p.m., there's going to be a special gathering at CFC Magic with all the churches. There's going to be a meal. There's going to be special music um, and sharing. Uh, again, I encourage you to get out there. Um, it's a great way to connect with the other believers of, of the North Country that we're in fellowship with. Um, so mark that on your calendars. Um, hope to see you there. Um, again, we'll be there, right? Yeah, definitely we'll be there for that one. Um, oh, yeah, t we still have T-shirts. Where, oh yes, wear your t-shirt. I'm actually wearing mine right now, underneath, underneath my button down. Um, I love our shirts. I just really do. I, I try to wear them whenever I can. But at, the, um, at that special gathering, um, if we all show up in our CFC Moira shirts and really represent um, Moira, that would be really special. Um, I'm sure the other churches will be wearing, a lot of people will be wearing their, their shirts too, but um, that would just be, that would just be a, a, it'd be a blessing. Um, if you don't have a shirt, see Allison. She'll get you a shirt. Um, Allison, thank you for doing that. That's, that's been great for us. Um, so Chris, if, if you're ready, we'll, we'll, take the, um, uh, we'll take up the tithes and offering. Um, are there any announcements that I'm missing? This is, these are the ones that I've got written down. OK. And uh, we will dismiss the children. So if um, any of the children who are um, going to be participating in Children's Church this morning, if you would stand, we'll pray for you as you go. Lord, we're so thankful for these young people among us. We pray that this time of learning your word uh, would be seed in their hearts that will grow uh, as they grow, uh, that in, in their adulthood as they face the challenges of this life uh, the scriptures that they learn and they let the lessons uh, that they hear about your heroes of faith uh, would encourage them to follow you at all costs and in your way we bless these young people in jesus name amen
All right. Young people can be dismissed. This morning, um, all right. This morning, we're going to be uh, in Hebrews chapter 12. So if you've got your Bible, I encourage you to open up to Hebrews chapter 12. Um, a number of, for a number of weeks, before we started the series that we are on right now on the, the meals, this theme that Pastor Rick's been preaching through, uh, the meals that Jesus shared with people, um, we did, a, we did a, a brief study on faith um, in the book of Hebrews, particularly chapter 11. And while we were doing that, I, I was studying, um, studying those passages and had some notes on Hebrews chapter 12. And so this morning... <clears throat> this morning is uh, kind of a result of that study in Hebrews chapter 12. Um, we're going to be looking at really uh, verses 1 through 13 of chapter 12. We'll recap a little bit of what we talked about from chapter 11. Um, and uh, this is going to be just a little bit of a study. Just, just let's see what these verses say, um, starting in verses 1 and 2 of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. <clears throat> now, that was the King James Version. Before I move on, I want to read that same, those same two verses in the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, because it highlights something that I want to draw out that I believe is important to understanding, in particular, the connection between chapter 11 and chapter 12. We'll get to it, but first I'm going to just read it um, out loud. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, it's subtle, but the, the difference that I want to point out here, and it will be, become apparent why I'm highlighting this in a moment. The difference here that I like in the CSB is that the first few words are, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses, instead of, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Again, that's going to become apparent in a minute. Since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses. So let's just quickly recap chapter 11 because this passage in 12 starts with a therefore. In other words, it's a continuation of a thought. Um, he's established something and now he's going to elucidate into a new point that builds off of that. So we're, let's talk about what that therefore is there for. The since Therefore, since, it points backwards, connecting the heroes that we read about in chapter 11 to the us that we're going to learn about in chapter 12. In chapter 11, we learn that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We learn that um, by, by it, by faith, the elders, which then chapter 11 talks about, those elders obtained a good testimony, a good report. You can say good things about them. We learned what faith looked like with these various hero, heroes. For, for instance, Abel offered a better sacrifice, and he obtained witness that he was righteous. And God himself testified of his gifts. Now, this word testimony is repeating. This word witness is the same thing. In other words, it's being seen and reported on. In Abel's case, by God himself. 
This is important. It's going to come up again. Enoch was taken away to not see death. He had this testimony. He pleased God. We learn that without faith, it is impossible to please God. In Noah, we see that he was warned by God, and he prepared an ark, which saved his family. Abraham left his homeland to a place promised as an inheritance. Sarah received strength to conceive and bear a child. Now, I just want to park there for a second. It's written in Hebrews that she received strength to conceive and bear a child. I feel like that is not emphasized enough. She's like 90 years old, and she's told you're going to have a baby, okay? Now, there's two things about that. One is that, okay, that's impossible, right? Number two is that even if it were possible, now I'm a 90-year-old woman having a baby. That is rough, okay? Now, ladies, who've, the mothers in the room are like, okay, yeah, I wouldn't want to do that at 90, right? As a man who has witnessed the births of his children, I'm like, okay, I wouldn't want you to go through that at 90 either. That's some faith there, okay? That is some major faith to say, okay, at 90, I'll do this for you, Lord, because this is your blessing. Abraham again was tested, and he offered up Isaac in that uh, when, when Jesus calls him, or God calls him to the mountain to sacrifice Isaac, believing that God would raise him. Of course, we know the end of that story he doesn't actually uh, put the dagger into Isaac. Um, God stops him, and, and the ram is uh, made visible. Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Jacob blesses the sons of Joseph, and Joseph gives instructions concerning his bones. If you're not familiar with those stories, those might not seem like a big deal, especially Joseph saying, hey, I'm dying here, bury me back in Canaan land. It, it maybe doesn't seem too important, but those those. Passages, Jacob blessing, uh, Isaac blessing Jacob and Esau, Jacob blessing the sons of Joseph, Joseph giving instructions are all, they do those things because there's a promise of an inheritance from Abraham. They're doing those things, and they would not have done those things except they believed the promise that Abraham was given that it would be to their seed. So Joseph, and I, I think this is really incredible, Joseph ends up in Egypt, and, and if you don't know that story, go to Genesis, read the story of Joseph. It's really incredible. But Joseph ends up in Egypt, a place that today we, we think of ancient Egypt, and we think of what? Mummies, right? Because of their the Egyptian religion and their obsession with ancestors and death, perfected this mummification process. And Joseph is there at that time and says, preserve me, but put, don't put me here where these people are going to like come to my tomb and worship me. Plant me there. That's where I belong. That's where you belong. Don't leave my bones here in Egypt. He does it because there's a promise. Amram and Jochebed, Moses' parents, they hide their child in danger of the Pharaoh and, and his edict. They hide their child and put him in the basket on the Nile. Act, major acts of faith. Moses himself, after he grows, he rejects Egypt and its riches so that he can suffer with the people of God and be recognized as a Hebrew. He keeps the Passover. He passes through the Red Sea. And then we read a litany of both named and unnamed heroes who are a mixed bag. Some see victory. They subdue kingdoms. They work righteousness. They obtain promises, etc. But they also suffer. There's torture. There's trials, imprisonment, and even death. And then we read this at the end of chapter 11, verses 39 and 40. 
and all these, the heroes that we just talked about, having obtained a good testimony. There's that word again. They obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Now, this, these two verses create the comparison between them, the heroes in the Old Testament, chapter 11, and us, who we're going to be talked about in chapter 12. They obtained a good testimony. Okay, so chapter 12 is going to be about how we obtain a good testimony. They did not receive the promise, uh, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. In other words, we have a promise just like they had a promise. They have not received it yet. They will not receive it until we also receive it. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us that we will not precede them. This verse tells us they will not precede us. We receive our reward at the same time they do. Therefore, we are obtaining a good testimony just like they were, and we're obtaining a promise. Perfection, when Jesus returns and, and at the resurrection, there's a goal. There is something to strive for. And then we get to verses 1 and 2 of, of chapter 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, so some of the ways that we're the same as them. We are to obtain a good testimony. Um, there is a promise. There is a race. We read about their lives, and that's kind of compared to a race. And we have to run our race like they ran their race or lived their lives, in faith, obtaining a good report. Um, and we await a promise like they run, um, await their promise. Um, if you were to condense all of that down into a short phrase, having learned about all these heroes of faith, therefore, let us run our race. Having known what they did, let us do our part as well. There is, and this is, this is also, this kind of blows my mind. The writer of the book of Hebrews says, God has something better for us. Bet something better for us than the people of whom the world was not worthy. These great heroes who did Incredible things, subdued kingdoms, had their children resurrected, all these things, but also suffered trials and torture and imprisonment and death. There's something better for us? That's something worth running for and running well for, whatever that thing is. So, what's, what's this passage about? Let's go and talk about the who, what, where, when, and why. The what is running the race. That's what this passage is about. And there's a why. There's a prize to obtain. And there's a testimony. The witnesses that inform us that we don't do this in secret. More specifically, why run? Why not just participate? Because there are onlookers including God. Remember back to Abel. It was God who had the testimony that Abel was righteous because of the sacrifice he gave. We're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. Now, just a, a second on this cloud of witnesses. There's some, there's some various thoughts of what this cloud of witnesses is all about. Some people say it's the dead that have gone before us or the angels. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, Pastor Rick talked about the martyrs, the, the, the witnesses. That word is martyrs, and we use that same word as P 
people who have suffered in the name of Christ. I believe that, I, well, I don't want to pick one of those and say this is what it is, but I believe the writer is actually being more broad than specifically picking out one of those things. Um, what he's saying is you're, surra you're surrounded by people and non-people like God who are seeing what you're doing, how you're doing, how you're doing it, and therefore do it well, do it right. Don't be just on the surface. Uh, Jesus would call people out during his ministry. One of the things that he called the scribes and Pharisees was, you're like whitewashed tombs. It's just, it's just the surface. And anybody who can see beyond that knows that you're dead inside. And so this, this mention of a crowd, a cloud of witnesses, um, it speaks of you're surrounded. You can't just put up a facade. You can't just, when there's people around, act nice. You can't just come to church on Sunday, sing a few songs, and go home and act like it never happened. You can't just say the right things sometimes and hope it's good enough. It's a cloud of witnesses. You're surrounded. That's, I believe, what he's getting to. And also there's this metaphor that we'll talk about in a second of um, like the Olympic Games. And uh, if you can imagine the Colosseum, I don't know if you've ever been to the Colosseum, um, but you've probably seen a picture. It's circular, right? Right? It's not a stage and people can only see your front so that you can, for acting, the Colosseum was circular, so there are spectators on all sides, and that's kind of the image that's going to be drawn out here. This cloud of witnesses say to us that you can't just be the whitewashed walls, you can't just put up a, a facade. You're seen from every angle, the secrets of your heart are seen. You know, if you include God in this cloud of witnesses, then that means 100% of you is viewed. If you include the angels, then at any time, in any place, you're being viewed and a testimony, a witness of who you are, how you act, and whether you are truly God's child will be revealed. You cannot escape the cloud, in other words. Um, and again, we're talking about a race, and uh, I, I'm just thinking back to when I was in middle school. Uh, at the beginning of middle school, they had us run the mile. I don't know if you had to do that. And they timed you, and they recorded it. And then at the end of middle school, they had you run the race again to see if you improved. Um, and I remember I wasn't a particularly athletic child, if you could probably tell, it's just, you know, I was more of, of the nerdy side of things. Um, so I was middle of the pack. The athletic kids, they, were, they wanted to beat each other, right? They wanted to be the best, so they ran as fast as they could. Uh, they wanted to get the best time that they could. But then there were also some who decided I'm just here to participate. I'm just going to walk it. You know, I'll get a passing grade just as long as I make it the entire mile. And so we all either ran or jogged, but then we had to sit in the grass and wait as the walkers finished their 20, 25 minute mile. And Listen, you don't have to win the race. You can't win the race. Jesus won the race, okay? But don't be one of those who takes their walk passively and says, I just want to barely pass. 
They're spectators. There's a witness that speaks to how well you're serving God. And God is watching. This encouragement of this, this, this exhortation of the race is calling us to run well and have a testimony that says this person is worthy of the prize at the end. So we got, we got the what, the race. We got the why, the prize. We've got the who, it's us. That one's easy. We've got the where, right here. We've got the when, right now. And then the rest of the passage is on the how. We've established that there's a race. We've established that we ought to run it well. But we have to ask, how? <laughs> how do we do that? Number one, we lay aside the weights and the sins which easily ensnare us. Pastor Rick, a few weeks, preached on that, did a great job about how this race that we're running, we can't be bogged down by the sin that we, that we brought into this relationship with God. And he's here to help us shed those things. They're like weights. Number two, we look to him. We look to Jesus as an example. Now, when we read this, look, looking to Jesus, the author and our finisher of our faith, that's very inspiring. We look at Jesus, and, and he inspires us to do well. But there's, there's something a little bit more that I want to draw out from the language here when it talks about looking to him, the author and finisher of our, of our faith. This author, um, the different translations will, will have this a little bit different. But author and finisher, it, it certainly works well. He writes the story of our faith. He begins it and he ends it. That's certainly theologically sound. But this word that we render author, archagon, has another meaning that I think fits the metaphor of the race a little bit better. And that is that archagon is a pioneer. It's somebody who goes before. Now, author, in English, we think of somebody writing, writing the story, beginning it, ending it. But this archaegon is like somebody who plows the path, makes the way easier for those who come, before, come after him. Um, an archaegon is somebody who would go take a city, like the, 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 the vanguard of the army would go take a fortified position so the rest could come in and, and occupy. Um, in terms of, of a contest in the Colosseum. Sorry, Ethan. I'm Italian. I need arm space for my talking. Um, this archaegon, you could think of it as we're on a team, and he is the star player, and he makes the game easier for the rest of us, the competition. He's the one without which we would be the losers of this competition. <clears throat> He's, uh, the, if you look in, in your strongs, one of the definitions will be one that takes the lead in anything and thus affords an example, a predecessor in a matter, a pioneer. Okay, so we're looking to our pioneer, the one who in this race has paved the way for us, and we're following the path that he went on. He's also the finisher, the teleotain. If you remember, I talked about how the heroes of the Old Testament had not received their promise. But we're looking to the author and finisher of our faith, the finisher of the race, who is sat down at the right hand of the throne in heaven. He has received his reward, or at least part of his reward, the beginning of his reward, because we are the rest of his reward. And when the resurrection happens, he will receive us and, and complete the rest of his reward. But what we see here is there is somebody who paved the way in the race and is already on the podium. He's at the top. And we're following him and we know the way to go, and we know 
that the reward is sure because we see him. This idea of Jesus ascending and then sitting down at the, at the right hand of the throne of heaven, I feel like it's a little bit neglected, but the, the disciples, the early apostles, that was really significant. They harped on it. They, it it's very regularly in their writings. Because seeing him ascended assures us of the promise of our reward. He made it there. And so we shall also. We see um, he's, he's not just the beginning of the race. He doesn't just do it well. He completes he actually completes the race, and we know we can complete it as well. And we know that he will, at the end, bring us to completion, right? Even if we die uh, before he returns, he will bring us again to himself. Um, so he's the one who has finished and received his reward. He's the one who ultimately brings us to the finish line. Now, getting back to this metaphor, the Olympic event which would have been something fresh in the minds of these, these early readers, probably would have gotten the metaphor, even though that they are Hebrews, they are living in, in a Greco-Roman world, and the idea of competition, the Olympic events, the Colosseum, would have meant something much different for them. Um, of course, Christians were being taken and, and made a spectacle of there uh, and killed, um, so it would have been familiar to them in that way, which is significant. Um, basically, he's saying, whoever the writer of Hebrews is, he's evoking this imagery of being taken to the Colosseum, being taken to the, to the circus, and being made a spectacle of, and enduring hardship and death, and saying, compete well. Don't just give up. Compete well. Jesus went through the same things. He's got a prize, you've got a prize. There's going to be spectators. Now, I could whitewash this message and talk about this, this race is just a glorious Olympics like we think of it now. You go to Japan or wherever it is, you run your race, everybody cheers, you get your medal. But this is actually kind of gruesome. There's spectators that are cheering for you to fight like a bear, right? And he's still saying, compete well. You're being watched. You're an example of Jesus. And even though you may die, there's a prize, the prize that Jesus has. Um, now, getting back to how to run with endurance. No, um, number three, we're talking about uh, why we need, uh, we talked about there's a race, why we need to run. We're looking at how, how do we do that? How do we run well? And this, this word endurance shows up and shows up several times. We're going to, again, come back to this several times as, as uh, we go uh, through the rest of chapter 12. How to run specifically with endurance. Hupomene, hupomene. Endurance. Um, this suggests not only that the race will be difficult, but it might be long. Um, and uh, so think of it like a long obstacle course, right? Not just a sprint, not just a marathon. But think of it like a marathon with obstacles along the way, like a wolf jumps out at you and tries to bite your feet off, right? Um, that's what the Christian life is really like. You're on this path, um, and there's things and people who are trying to knock you down. But somebody has actually completed the race and is on the podium. And so this is like the interviewer after, after the race is over going to the, the winner and saying, how did you do it? How did you make it through? We're asking, we're looking to Jesus 
But how did he do it? What did it look like? Um, number one, as we ask, how did he do it? We see what he endured and how he endured it, and we ready ourselves to endure as well. Number one, we ought to accept that this is not meant to be easy. I am not going to, if I meet one of the Afghan refugees, tell them that this Christian life is meant to be easy. They know it's not. There's persecuted Christians all over the earth in various places. They're the most uh, notable right now because they're in the news, but there's Christians all over the world suffering real hostility. And we ourselves ought to understand that that can very well come to us and be ready for it. Um, we, we've, this theme has come up a number of times as, we, as we've talked about faith. We should understand that this is not, it is not the exception to the rule of Christianity, that there is hostility. Number two, as we look at Jesus, he accepted it. He didn't just accept it. He accepted suffering, the need for endurance, as the will of the Father. Jesus, we, we know, was regularly in prayer, connecting with the Father, finding out what his will was. He would regularly say, I only do what I see my father do. I only do what my father says, just following the father. And then we see him at the Mount of Olives before the crucifixion, and he's praying. He prays three times, Lord, if there's any way, if there's any other way, if we can do this any other way, if there's, if there's another way that we can save them, is there something else that we can do? Yet not my will, but yours be done. If there's another way, let this cup pass from me. But if this is how it has to be, knowing he was about to suffer on the cross, if this is how it has to be, I will obey. So number two, accept this as the will of the Father. Be connected with the will of the Father. Um, number three, Jesus does not lash out or use his power or authority to retaliate against those who persecuted him, who were hostile towards him. We know Jesus' power. You know, you read the Gospels, and like 90% of it is him displaying his power and teaching. And at any time, really, he could have called angels down and, and said, get me out of here, get me off this cross, at any time with a word, he could have stopped the lashes. He could have stopped the mocking. He could have interrupted the trial. And yet he remained silent. God says, vengeance is mine. In other words, as we're persecuted, as the world targets us, we are not to retaliate and fight against them. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the powers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. We're not to fight against the people who the enemy is using to persecute us, fight the spiritual wickedness. That's not, that's not to say don't be politically active or um, you know, go to the school board meeting or, or whatnot. Um, those things, that's not what I'm saying. It's the people, don't retaliate them. Don't take vengeance into your own hands. Uh, don't take retaliation to your own hands. Number four, he forgave while hanging on the cross. Father, forgive them. What a powerful statement. Number five, he led others to the Father. This blows my mind. Jesus hanging on the cross, he's being mocked. He's being mocked by the people down there. He's being mocked even by the other guys hanging on the cross. And he ends up leading one to the Father. The guy says, what are we doing? This, this man is perfect. Hey, would you remember me when you come into that kingdom that, that 
that you're going to. And Jesus says, you, you will see me there. Yeah. Leads him to the Father. He cared for the weak. And this one, even more so, blows my mind. Again, hanging on the cross, looks down and sees Mary. Says, hey, John, take care of her. She's going to be without me. He's taking care of business. He's making sure the weak are taken care of. Basically, to recap all these things, um, be, be ready to endure, um, accept it as the will of the Father, uh, do not lash out, forgiving, leading others, caring for the weak. Basically, anything that could be considered part of the Christian life, add to that while enduring. How do we do it? We do the Christian life while enduring hardship. We don't wait for hardship to pass to resume serving God. We do all of these things while enduring hardship. But then now we ask the question, what is it that we're to endure and how do we endure it? <clears throat> um, start uh, Verses 3 and 4. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Uh, against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. So now this, uh, this separates two different types of enduring. Number one, enduring actual hostile persecution, which we talked about. Again, this could be us someday. But like the Hebrews that are being written to, we, in this room have not quite endured to bloodshed, or at least I'm assuming um, that none of you have like been whipped for your Christianity in your lifetimes. Um, and certainly, nobody here has died for your faith, because you're sitting here. Um, this, so this, uh, this, you have not resisted to bloodshed, kind of, is something that we can take for ourselves. Not being ones who are actively in a hostile situation, though we may be, we can look at this next passage as specifically speaking to us. And so this is where we're going to go next. Um, the writer starts with a quote of Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12, um, and then continues that thought, expands that thought. Uh, starting in verse 5 of uh, Hebrews 12. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. This is the quote of Proverbs. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? So we're going to stop there. It goes on. Again, we're asking ourselves, how? How do we do this running the race with endurance thing? So looking, looking at verses 5, 6, and 7, what we see is that when God speaks correction or chastisement in our times of prayer or through the study of the Bible, or through the preaching of the word, during a Sunday service, or some, some sort of other uh, time of, of sharing. When God speaks correction or chastisement in something, ah, mm, that hits me at home, that, that speaks to something that's not right. We welcome and accept it. We say, yes, Lord, you're right. We've, we have to remember there's a prize, there's a reward in Christ, there's a race, there's spectators. And when God brings correction into our lives, we have to say, okay, this is for my benefit. He's like a father correcting me so that I can run well. This correction might be painful, but it's good. Lord, speak to me. We welcome God speaking to us in ways of correction and chastisement. Continuing on, verse 8. But if you are without chastening, in other words, if 
if for some reason you're going through life and have not experienced some sort of chastening from the Father, some sort of correction, <clears throat> if you are without chastening, of which we all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. In other words, if you're not experiencing some sort of correction for the Father, something is wrong. Your connection to the Father is off. Because if you're connected with your Father, if you've got that relationship with Him, there will be correction. So, if you're not experiencing that, you should ask yourself, what's going on? Why am I not experiencing this? Is there something wrong with my connection to the Father? The writer says, if you're not experiencing that, you're illegitimate. It might be you're a pretender. If life is just, it's all good, I'm saved, going to heaven, and there's no correction, you're still able to do all the same things that you were able to do before, could be that you're just making it up. That's, those are harsh words. Moving on to verse 9. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he, God, our Father, for our profit, then that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, if you underline or highlight in your Bible, that's a good one to highlight. The peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That's what comes from the chastening of the Father. And that's what we're after. We're after this holiness um, of, of the Father. We're after the fruit of righteousness that comes with his correction. Um, the fruit that he wants to bring out of our lives is visible, right? Uh, there's, this is the tension when talking about faith, and it starts way back in uh, chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We too often think about our faith as something that is invisible, is our belief. It's just something in our heads. There must be something visible for the world to see, a fruit that, uh, that is grown, and one of the ways that it is grown is through the correction that comes from the Father. It is something that the world can see and testify of, that they can witness, that when the story of our lives, if it were to be written, written by the people who succeed us after our deaths, they would write, this person followed Christ. It is also evidence of the fruit, is also evidence of being connected to the root. If there is fruit in your life that comes through correction, chastisement, that's proof that you are connected to the Father, which is the opposite side of the coin. If there's no correction, you may be illegitimate. Being corrected by the Father shows you that he's your Father. Now moving on to verses 12 and 13. Therefore. Now this is the final therefore. This is the capstone of uh, what has built up through verse 11, or chapter 11, and then um, the explanation of chapter 12. It's capped with this. Therefore. Strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. You are, after all, running a race. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Okay? It's hard. It's painful. 
<clears throat> this verse recognizes that as I stand here and tell you, you got to run the race, you got to run the, with endurance, you got to run it well, there are people watching, that you are inwardly looking and saying, I don't think I'm able. I have this in my life. I have that in my personality. I've got this trauma in my past. I, I'm not able to do this. I'm not articulate. I, I, I'm not brave. I, I failed again. I, I succumbed to temptation and I sinned. These verses recognize that you're going to look at yourself and say, I don't think I can do it. And the exhortation is, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. In other words, instead of giving up because you have these infirmities or weaknesses or genuine brokenness that could disqualify you from the race, instead of passively taking the 25-minute mile way of doing things, instead of the, I can't do it, I might as well sit on the sideline way of doing things, he says, get up. Get on those feet. Lift those hands up. There is healing. There's grace. As you participate in the will of the Father and say, Lord, what, do you have me to, what would you have me to do? How would you have me to act? And he gives you something that you can't do. Say, I will do it. Yes, I will. And he will provide the grace for that to be done. We looked at Isaiah chapter 6 earlier. Isaiah is undone. He realizes, I'm in the midst of an unclean people. Somebody's got to do something about this, but I can't do it. I'm unclean. God says, who's going to go? I'll go, but I can't do it. He sends the... It's a, the picture is an angel takes a coal from the altar, cleanses his lips. Basically, the, what that's speaking to is when God's got something for you to do, say, I'll do it, and he will provide the way. He'll provide the healing for you to be able to do that. He's got a race for you to run. Say, I will run it. I'll get up. And he'll provide the healing for you to be able to run that race. It's a hard, painful thing, but there is help. And there are regular exhortations in, in this passion, there are several exhortations to not give up. Verses 12 and 13 um, basically sum that up, but if you go back to verse 3, you read, the, read this. Jonah, Jonas, if you'd get verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Look at verse 5 which again is, is a quotation from Proverbs 3, 11. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. This word being discouraged, it kind of giving up, being, being made weary, this word discouraged is the opposite of enduring. It's the opposite. It's the difference of being loosed, Kind of the, the picture is being, being loosed out. Just, I uh, give up. I can't do it. And then by remaining. Those are the two pictures of the two words that are being compared to one another. Instead of being, in, instead of being in a position of giving up or being passive, be active, be ready to remain, to endure. This all comes down to all of this to say, do not be discouraged. Do not be weary in well-doing. Don't allow your infirmities, your struggles, um, the fact that you gave in to temptation when you knew you shouldn't have, um, don't allow the difficulty of it all 
don't allow the, the naysayers, the people who want to persecute you, don't let them stop, stop you. Do not be discouraged. All of this is to say, do not be discouraged. Stand fast. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, this is the, the end of a great passage about the resurrection, this great instruction how to live and what to live for. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Participate in what God has, has for you. Run this race. It will not be in vain. There's help. He's going to help you get through it. There's grace. Strengthen the hands which hang, hang down the feeble knees. Make straight paths for feet. That it will not be, the, what is lame will not be dislocated, but rather healed. There's help to get you through that. And as we choose to endure and not be discouraged, his spirit will help us. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Ethan, would you, would you come? I want, I want to sing that Magnify the Lord uh, song. It was so poignant. It's, it was, it's a new one to me, um, but as we were singing, um, I thought, boy, this really captures what we're after. Therefore, strengthen the hands, hands with ha which hang down the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather healed. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's worship the Lord one more time before we go. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one her eye, then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky. From rivers to the mountain tops, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. With every creature find its inmost melody and every human heart's native cry then in one enraptured hymn of praise we'll sing Christ be magnified oh Christ be magnified let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. Go, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Oh. 
I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Cause death has been defeated, we have resurrection life. And if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory, with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing, my song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified, let it praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me, oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me, oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified. From the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Amen. This week, uh, I, will, I encourage you to continue to focus on the holiness of God in, in your prayer times. Um, ask Him to speak to you. Ask Him to speak into your life. Um, and if there's some correction, if there's some chastisement, to say, Lord, I welcome what you have to say. And in this way, you'll be, you'll have a testimony. You'll be a witness of who God is, what he's done in your life, to the people around you. And you'll, you'll be a light in this dark, dark world. Bless you. Uh, I, I pray that this week will be filled with the presence of the Lord. Go and go.